Hi there, Rockstar, and welcome to Stand Out, Get Noticed. I'm Christina Cantus, founder of The C Method, where I'm all about helping people to build powerful communication skills. You can learn more at thecmethod.com. Today's podcast is all about taking initiative, and I'm very excited to welcome back to the podcast, Joshua Spodek. Now, Joshua is a very accomplished human being. He's taught, he's practiced and coached leadership and entrepreneurship at Columbia, NYU and private corporations for nearly two decades. He's the author of the best-selling book, Leadership Step by Step, and he's recently published a new book called Initiative, A Proven Method to Bring Your Passions to Life. He also hosts the award-winning Leadership and the Environment podcast. He writes a column at Inc., And his projects have been featured in all sorts of publications like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Forbes. Oh, did I also mention that he holds five Ivy League degrees, including a PhD in astrophysics? Um, And other things is he does burpees every day. So far, he's at 130,000 and counting. And he walks his talk when it comes to doing things for the environment, such as, you know, he picks up at least one piece of litter a day, he doesn't fly anymore, and he doesn't buy food wrapped in packaging. So he's all about demonstrating, you know, what he's teaching. And I highly recommend that you check out his podcast, Leadership and the Environment. Um, It's an awesome listen, and he shares many nuggets of wisdom um, as well on that show. So I was really excited to get Joshua on the show Oh, by the way, he also joined us in episode 96, where we talked about um, leadership and being authentic. So if you enjoy this podcast, definitely go back and have a listen to to that one. Now, today, I'm going to share with you this conversation that we had around initiative. And Joshua and I talk about why people often struggle to find their passion, uh, what holds people back from starting projects, and the steps required for bringing a successful passion project or business idea to life. So if you want to start a project but you don't have any ideas, or maybe you want to start taking initiative at work and present some ideas you know, to upper management and get those realized, or maybe you have so many ideas that you just don't know which one to pick and you're stalling and not doing anything about them, then I highly recommend that you listen to this episode. The skills that Joshua talks about is they're all incredibly valuable and you can use them whether you're a budding entrepreneur or looking to advance your career. Show notes for this episode will be at thecmethod.com slash 216. Okay, let's move on to this conversation with Joshua Spodek. There's a lot of people out there who say, I want to start a business. I want to start a company. I want to start a project. Actually, and it doesn't even have to be, you know, once you start picking up on it, there's a lot of people who want to have more control over what they do in their job. They don't necessarily want to file with the state to get an LLC or to get benefits packages for their employees. And when I ask them, People who have not started something but want to start something, why they haven't started something, the number one answer by far is, I don't have an idea. If I talk to people who are running something, whether it's a division in a company that they started, uh, if, it's, if it's a hobby, a podcast, if it's you know something, but it could be a startup. If I ask them, is what you're doing now the idea that you started with? Never. I've not heard someone say it's exactly what I started with. And it's always something changed. And so if you talk to entrepreneurship people, they'll say, yeah, we, we got to iterate and pivot. But it's not always the case because a lot of people don't start, a lot of people don't have ideas, but that doesn't mean that they can't love something that they do and serve an audience so well that that audience rewards them back. And that conflict, contradiction, that, that the, the same thing that successful people are, they use it to get started. They're like, well, I got to get started with something and then I can iterate and change. It's exactly what holds back the people who don't start, which tells me it's not the idea. If the idea can work for some and not for others, it's the people, it's the skills. And I believe that it's a social emotional skills and that, that make the difference. And if you want to develop social emotional skills, read, you can read all you want. You can watch all the videos. You can take all the courses if they're lecture based or if they're, they're uh, case study based. They don't teach social emotional skills. You got to do it through practice. And everyone, it's in other fields where you have to learn to perform social emotional skills acting, the military, sports, playing a musical instrument, everybody knows you start with the basics. 
And I looked around, you know, practicing in piano, it's playing scales. It's in tennis, it's hitting ground strokes. In basketball, it's dribbling. In the military, they call military basic training because it's training basic stuff. And there's no basic training. There's no scales for how to start a project that could be entrepreneurial, but just starting something <clears throat> where you're going to organize people. You're going to satisfy need. Ideally, that is something that you love. And that's what I wanted to create. Can I, pa- can I pause you there for a moment? <clears throat> yeah. So when we talk about starting something, starting a project, let's say we take someone who's working, you know, they're, they're working in a corporation, maybe they're a, a leader at work, they've got a team, they've got a family at home, they're super busy, they've got so many things going on. Why would they consider, you know, starting a project? Like why, why is that something that would benefit them? It's to have control over what they want to do. I mean, what The big thing driving me is that, I was getting a PhD in physics. This is in the 90s. And <clears throat> pardon me, it's an Ivy League degree. And it's my fourth Ivy League degree at that. And so I'm at the pinnacle of Western education. And now I realized I didn't want to keep doing research. So I didn't want to continue with the with science. I love science. I always will. But I felt trapped. I felt like, what can I do with a physics PhD? And the things that were available to keep doing what I didn't want to do I could go to Wall Street, didn't want to do that. I could go into military industrial complex stuff. I didn't want to do that. And, you know, I, t- I tell a story about now I've turned this into a talk where I, I say to an audience, you guys are well-educated. You know of other people who started projects and they could, you know, Bill Gates, Michael Dell, you know, people like that. And they can go and do, you know, I ask the audience, you, you know about them. Of course they do. They could do whatever they wanted. They, pick, they happen to pick what they did, but they could have done anything. And they would say yes. And I say, but you, like I, feel trapped. And I can do this with graduate students. I can do this with McKinsey. I can do this with, you know, wherever I do it. They're always like, yes. And I say, you feel you have fewer options, but you have more education. Isn't that the opposite of what an education is for? And so driving me is that starting my first company was my exit from feeling trapped. And it created all sorts of options. Now, I happened to start a company my first time. But I've learned that these skills can be applied to many different things. So now that I began my book with a story of Raphael because Raphael came to me and he felt trapped. He felt, I keep telling my managers, I want to do these projects. And these projects are great. They're clearly profitable for the company. They're beneficial. And the managers would always say, well, let's think about it. And then usually they wouldn't even respond. But when they did, they'd say, well, we have to shelf this. And so he came to me and he said, I didn't know this until he told me. Uh, but what he started with, it was, I have to leave this company. I can't work for anyone again. I have to do my own thing. And you started companies. So I'm hiring you as a coach to help me through this. And I started by working with him, doing exercises to get him to start a company. But actually, he, he didn't tell me he was doing this. He was using what I was teaching him to repropose projects in a more effective way. Instead of saying, take it or leave it, as he was doing he would say early on, before it was really formed, he would say to his manager, here's this thing I'm working on. I wonder if you could give me some advice, which is what the exercises do is to get advice and draw people into the project. And when they give you advice, they feel the project, they feel they've contributed to the project and they feel if you, they want you to succeed because if you succeed based on in part their advice, they feel like they're part of that. I think it's really interesting and important to point out that um, someone like Raphael, who you're talking about, he was able to use initiative, what you taught him, to implement and create projects within his company. Yeah. And that way he felt more like he had more options. He felt like he could contribute more. Yeah. And also he created relationships with the decision makers so that they were part of it. They were supporting him for their own personal reasons. And mm. one day he came to me and he said, Josh, I don't need to start another company. I was like, I thought that's what you hired me. He goes, I got the project that I wanted to work on. And, he was, and then he explained right. to me how he was doing all this stuff. And that's when I, part of when I realized the skills of initiative, the social and emotional skills can apply to entrepreneurship, but that's a small subset. The, this is a superset, and which I think is more broad and more general. So can you tell me, Josh, what, what is your definition of initiative? Well, it's to take, it's to start something. I mean, it's, it's, um, what the goal of this of the book is to enable people to start a project that will reveal either based on a, a passion that they know already, and by passion I mean a strong emotion, a strong motivation that they already know, or it will draw it out. 
And to create a project that solves someone else's pro another group's problem so well that they reward you back to make it self-sustaining. So entrepreneurship fits within that, but it's not the only thing that fits with, within that. Okay. So you, you talk about how, I mean, you're, you're very much about, you know, practical step-by-step -step exercises and you, you're all about teaching these, these emotional and social skills for people to, to get these projects off the ground. So can you share with us, you know, what is the first step? How, what is the first step to developing the skills that allow us to start taking initiative? So step one, the first exercise that I give in the book is to write a personal essay. And that's, it's not, that's not really a new thing. A lot of people have written personal essays before. It gets you moving in a direction. I give a couple specific things. List, there's a couple lists of people to put in there, people in the field that you want to go into. Because I want to make sure people get that this is about people and this is about your relationships with other people as well as with yourself. The first thing that's really specific to, the, to taking initiative is to write down five problems that you see. For, in the essay, you've picked a, uh, a field that you want to go into. And it, it's not restrictive in that if you, have, if you think about maybe going this and maybe going that, maybe going another, it, you'll pick one to work with first, but that doesn't mean that that's the one you're going to end up in. But it, I want to give someone direction. And then to look at that field and think of five problems in that field. And they can be simple problems. They can be complex problems. The, the scale of the problem, not that important, surprisingly. And that's one of the big skills is to realize that it doesn't take much to have. It's not the idea. It's a seed that you can then use as, a, as what you work the next exercises through. So the next exercises, if you don't mind me jumping into what comes next, is... Well, can I share yeah. maybe an example of what this problem could be that you're passionate about? So like, for example, I, I hate it. I hate seeing people use those disposable coffee cups every single day. And that's a problem that I, that I see every day. Would that be an example of a problem that you're passionate about to write about in step one? Uh, yes. You don't have to be passionate about it now. The field is oh, something okay. you should be generally into. What will happen is the first couple of things people are, something that stops a lot of people is they feel like the, this idea, if it's not worth it, if it's not big enough people laugh at them or they'll say you should work on something else or, and it takes a while for people to get, and this is something that comes out of these exercises is that what people love to do is often, we've been hurt so many times, we've been laughed at and judged and so forth that we push it down inside, we cover it up, not because we want to, just because it's, it's easier not to share stuff and just talk about the weather and sport. That's why we talk about weather and sports is to avoid these People saying, oh, that, you know, we get judged. And so we keep stuff inside. And so Have you usually, experienced that before? Yeah. The example I usually give, when, once when I was in high school, my sister came back from Japan and she bought me this shirt. And I don't know, in Japan, it might've looked cool, but I wore it to school and everyone laughed at me. So that didn't feel good. And the problem was easy to, the problem was easily solved. I simply never wore the shirt again, at least not to school. Now, I also happen to be pretty good at science and math. And I would get laughed at for that too. Well, that I can't just leave at home. That's inside me. It's in fact a critical part of who I am. And so if I didn't want to get laughed at or bullied, I would have to not share that. I would try to hide that. Now, as a matter of practice, it wasn't very easy to do because people could tell about me right away. I was pretty geeky. I still am pretty geeky. <laughs> uh, at least now I have some options of being other ways, other ways too, I think. So <laughs> I would try to push that down. I would try to hide that. So my first couple of years in college, I took, I think I took a physics class, but then I stopped taking the physics classes. Now that's kind of funny because I got a PhD in it. So that meant there were a couple of years when I did not practice what became my greatest passion for several years, for almost a decade. So that's a pretty crappy life to push down inside me, to hide, to try to hide from the world what was one of my, what became one of my greatest passions. It was then one of my greatest passions. I just didn't realize it. So what brought it out? In part, it, practicing it. You know, I, it, what happened was I ended up doing an education program where I was going to become a high school teacher. And I thought, well, I can teach math. I can teach science. So I had to take among the teaching and sociology classes and psychology classes. I also had to take what I was going to teach. So I, was go I went back to taking math and physics classes now under the guise of something else. And I was taking them. I was like, man, I love these classes. And so by the, I guess I'd matured enough in that time to decide it was worth it for me. But had I not done the things, see, that's, these exercises are to get you to do things. And in doing them, Passions will emerge. Anyone who's listening to this and thinking, I don't have any passions. They, every, everyone who has said that to me in, the, in of my students, and there's hundreds of people and clients, it's always come out. 
And the trick is, of the several tricks, to try to get it at the beginning, to pick like, what's my greatest passion? If you're lucky and it's obvious, great, go with it. For the other 99% of us, most of the time you're not really aware of what it is. And that's why I'm, I, call, I keep calling the problems that you come up with at the beginning rudimentary, or if you come up with a solution to the problem, rudimentary, because if you work on something that's even generally related to what you want to do, the more you work on it in an effective way, not just randomly doing things, you know, piano scales aren't just hitting the keys. It's hitting the keys in a specific way that people have figured out over the over centuries. And so these exercises get you to do things that move you forward. And if it's something that you love, that love will emerge, that passion will emerge. If it's something that you don't, it will lead you to what does faster and more effectively than any other way, certainly than trying to think or answering some HR questionnaire of like what field is right for you. So why is it so, why is it effective in leading you to something that you are passionate about? Because if there's, if there's two things that might be passions of yours, you're not sure which one it is, or there's a few, for a lot of people there's lots, then what happens when you start working on one, if it's not your greatest passion, you still develop the, the skills. And one of the emotional skills is to sense what excites you, what gets you going. And if you work on A when B is actually the one that's really the one for you, A will start to lose its luster. It'll raise its luster as you start working on it because you'll, oh, this could really work. And then after a while, you realize that's not really what I wanted to do. And B will, as those social and emotional skills increase, B will start becoming more and more important to you and it will not lose its luster. And you will at one point, it's kind of funny. A lot of people feel like, won't I waste my time working on the wrong thing? Or what if it gets me, what if I, what if I wake up with the wrong spouse and a mortgage and a kid, you know, except with ideas, it doesn't, with relationships, it might happen that way, but with people, it doesn't happen that way with, I mean, with projects, it doesn't happen that way. If A loses its luster and B doesn't, you will switch to B and you will, you will get not sick of A, but you'll have to, you'll want to get rid of it so fast. And you'll wonder how did I like that? But you will, you'll move away from it with gratitude and you'll be, mm. you'll think to yourself, I wish I'd done A earlier because A is what got me to B. Hey, Rockstar. Last week on the podcast, I announced that I'm looking for 10 founding members for the C-Method Academy. Uh, An update, these spots have all been filled. And a big thanks to those first 10 people who got in super quick. Now, on the subject of initiative and sharing your ideas and and iterating, I will be working with these 10 founding members to develop up the idea of the C-Method Academy, which will be a monthly training and membership site where we dive into the concepts talked about on the podcast, we'll study them and apply them and receive feedback and support from the community of members and coaches. Now, I have created a wait list for those of you who want to be a part of the C-Method Academy and, most importantly, want to be first to be notified when we launch. I will be opening up membership for the next round of, you know, second founding members, and that will be at a heavily discounted early bird rate. So if you want to be the first to be notified, go to thecmethod.com slash join and sign up to be on the wait list. That's thecmethod.com slash join. Okay, let's get back to the show. So we've got our personal essay. So in this, we're, we're writing about um, maybe a rudimentary problem that we would like to solve, but that it doesn't would be the have second to be step. related to a Pardon? First the essay, then the then writing down the problems. Oh, and then writing down the problems. Yeah, it's okay. two separate steps. And then what comes after that? So then you go to, then there's a whole series of steps where you go to other people and what people want to do from practice is they want to get advice. They want to get judgment from people. But what you actually do is you get advice from people. And so first, I start with people close to you who are non-judgmental and supportive. And so you say to them, basically, here's this idea, a problem and a solution. And here's, I wonder if you could give me some advice on how to improve it. And at this stage, you have five problems and some rudimentary solutions. And there's a lot of practice in how to make these conversations flow, how to lead these conversations, because people really like to talk about them but you really want to get specific advice. And then at the end of this stage, you narrow down from five to one based on their votes and also just your own, the, the ideas evolving. And by the, after talking to five people and getting advice from each, at this stage, usually you've picked one and you start to have an attachment to it because 
you've helped change it and other people have helped you, people in your world have helped change it. The next step is now you go to 10 friends and family who are a little bit farther away than the first group. And you do the same thing, except with one solution, one problem solution. And say you talk to 10 people at this stage and you get three pieces of advice from each. That's 30 pieces of advice. And you've been iterate, you iterate it along each time. And now you start, it starts really taking shape. So I'm going to speak broadly, if it's okay, about next stages. Sure. You can increasingly talk to people in the field that you are going into. At the beginning, you're not getting great advice. Most of the time, the people in your world aren't going to give you the best advice. They're just the most helpful people, the most supportive people. So do we start with them because that's the easiest place to start because they already know us, they, they love us, and we feel comfortable talking with them? Yeah, it's because you develop the skills easier there. I guess yeah, sure. I think of it, the, the tennis game begins with the serve, but serves are really hard. So you don't start practicing the serve right away. You work up to that. You start with ground strokes mm. and simple things. And so if you want to learn these, the social skills of getting advice and listening to people so that they feel like, you know, when you ask people for advice, a lot of times they feel like, oh, good thing you asked me. I happen to be an expert. And you want them to get that feeling. And Are people afraid of asking oh, experts yeah. and industry people for advice? Yes, they they totally are. And then ideally, they're chomping at the bit to do so at the end. Because as you work up to more and more people who are in the field more, a couple of things happen. One, because you've done it so many times before, people ask you questions that you've already answered. And so when they hear you answer, when a person in the field hears you answer knowledgeably about something in the field, they're like, oh, you're one of us. And sometimes you'll start getting, you'll talk to someone in the field and you've already, they mentioned someone and you're like, oh, I talked to that person. And so you're in the network. Mm -hmm. And when you talk, when you present yourself as a problem solver in a field and you know other people in that field, you're one of them, you're a peer. And that's why towards the end of it, when it's time, the last exercise is to talk to valuable people in the field. So valuable could mean lots of different, you know, usually it's funding sources, but it could be uh, people who are very well connected or it could be people who know how to solve a particular problem of yours. A yeah. lot of times people do this. Some people do these exercises in, in just over a month and they're talking to people in the field and the people in the field see them as a peer and they have no idea that the idea didn't even exist six weeks before. And people are like, people who do the exercise are shocked. They're like, shouldn't I tell them? I'm like, you can tell them if you want, but you don't have to. They, <laughs> they see you as a peer. End of story. And you, they want you to succeed. You know, this is a really, it's a really great point you're making here because uh, like a lot of people I meet, they, they tell me that they get very nervous and, and intimidated when talking to experts in the field or, you know, talking to very senior people, you know, because they put them up on this pedestal. And what you're describing here is it sounds like when your students go to, to speak to these experts in the field, they're, they're, they're seen as, as equals, which would I imagine would make the conversation much much easier. I got I got to tell you Joanne's story. Joanne, yeah, sure. NYU has a lot of international students, so she was I think from Hong Kong. English not is, is not her native language, so she speaks conversationally but not fluently. And she was doing a project that involved Broadway shows, and she wanted to talk to a producer, and she didn't know how to reach the guy. All she knew was that he was doing a play at a particular Broadway theater. So she's like, how do I reach the guy? So she calls up the, the ticket office because obviously ticket offices will always answer the phone. And she goes, I'm looking for so-and-so. And the, per and the person's it's like, ah, puts her on hold. And by the way, we're in class now. So she's telling me this and the whole class yeah. is kind of listening and they're kind of like, ah, the what? they're just kind of listening. And so she's on hold for a little bit and then the phone picks up and she hears the voice of the other and go, what? What? Yes, what? And she goes, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I called up. I'm looking for so-and-so. And the person goes, yes, that's me. And it's the guy, right? She, like, she reached the this director. famous <laughs> producer. Yeah, this Broadway producer. producer. And, and so she, the, everyone in the class now is like, sits up. They're like, what? How'd you, you know, like, this is amazing. And so the Broadway, she's like, what do I say? What do I do? Now, here's what happened. If, you know, anyone who's watched um, Karate Kid knows the wax on, wax off, you know, She's done this so many times that even though she doesn't know what to do, she just autopilot says the things that she's been saying to the friends and family and to the people who weren't big people, in the, not the valuable people in the field. And she goes, and there's a script that's in the book that's like, you don't have to follow it. But she did basically, I'm a student at NYU. I'm working on this entrepreneurial project. And I, I wonder if I, you're an expert in the field. And I wonder if you could give me a couple ideas or a, a couple of suggestions to improve it. And she goes, what? 
right, kind of angry. And she goes, <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing. And he goes, well, you should do that. And he kind of spurts out the answer. That's how, that's the impression I got. And, and she's like all freaked out. And the whole class is listening. And so with you, I'm going to be a little less, a little more direct than I was with her. Because with her, she was flustered and there were emotions at play. But I walked her through that she wasn't injured. She, no one saw this and laughed at her. She didn't lose any money. And in fact, she got useful advice. And so I went through the series of questions to walk her through, seeing that it wasn't that big of a deal as much as the, I mean, the emotions were real. She was, she felt flustered. And then at the end, I asked her, would you do it again if you could? And she was like, yes. And the whole rest of the class, as a teacher, you love stuff like this because it began a race to the top in the class that they want, they all wanted to have something like that happen. And what made it succeed, certainly her gumption to, to call the place up because she didn't have to but that she had done it so many times that she had the social skills to do it and she didn't have to think about it and it works. And so now I pre- I've lost touch with her. She's back in Hong Kong, last I heard, but I presume that these are skills that she can now do. And actually that's other students, the other stories have talked about how there's one of my students that she eventually went to law school and her classmates keep asking her, well, how is it that you get these choice internships and you get to work with all these great professors? And she's like, I ask. And <laughs> she's like, they, they don't ask. I don't know what they're waiting for. But she also says she used to also wait. And so want to know some things that this applies to. If you're a student and you're you know, in a professional school, you want to work with the most effective professionals. And this is the sort of thing that she doesn't go up and say, can I work with you? She goes up and says to them, this is my interest and I wonder if I could, you know, if I wonder if you could give me some advice on how to think about this sort of thing. So she caters the skills that she learned here into the particular use there. If you're, I mean, Raphael, he he had access to them, to the managers. He just led the conversation to judge him. And, you know, when you judge, you put them on a pedestal, they, all they can do is look down at you. And he'd be lucky if he got something, but he was really playing a game of battleship. You know, like A7, miss. Uh, B8, miss. It doesn't help you get to the next stage. The advice does. So Raphael went and asked, so he went and asked for their advice. So he went through that process. Yeah, before, instead of trying to create a perfect idea that then they, that they would approve, he had um, a, a rudimentary idea and would ask them for advice. And that way, they also helped make it a great idea. And by the time it was a great idea, so much of them was in it that they, how could they not say Yes. Because, yeah, and it absolutely. was him on his own, it would never, he probably could not have made it so great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Joshua, it's so awesome to to speak with you. And, and I love the way that, that you're teaching this and breaking it down into into really simple steps that people can follow. And I and I love how your, your steps of building up the skills of, you know, sharing your ideas with people and not putting people up on a pedestal. Um, the way I see that as being beneficial in that, you will feel naturally more comfortable even having those conversations as opposed to thinking, I have to present this perfect idea and be judged on it, which is very a very scary thought. Um, Josh, do you have any final words for the listeners? You know, it's all, everybody has these passions inside them. I said it before, and a lot of people say one of two things, but it's really the same thing. I don't have any ideas or I have so many ideas, I don't know which to start with. And the reason I say it's the same is it's not knowing your priorities well enough to be confident to act on it. And thinking things through will only get you so far, but acting on them gets you much farther. And this book gives you a way to act on it in a way that's, uh, you know, I don't want to lie. There's going to be some anxiety. It's not like trivial, but it, it works. And you will look back and say, I, that was there. That has always been there. I've known that for so long. Why didn't I act on it before? I wish I'd acted earlier. It's it's there. <laughs> Love it. Joshua, can you tell uh, tell us where we can find your book and also tell us about your podcast? Yeah, so everything's at joshuaspodek.com. And so in the upper right corner is the, pod, is the links to the podcast and to the book and all, lots of other things too. And uh, so the podcast, the Leadership in the Environment podcast is, you know, I'd always acted environmentally. And well, in Australia, you might not know that we elected a president who I suspected was not going to move in the direction that I felt was right for the environment. 
And I felt like me acting on my own was not enough. I really wanted to take, I think uh, there's missing leadership in this area. And so I bring leaders to the environment and I have really world-renowned people on the podcast. I'm trying to get them to share what they care about, what, what the environment means to them, to act on that in the hopes that people listening will also look inside themselves and think of what they care about because it's going to be unique to everybody. And then to act on that because when they do, and I have the guests on a second time, when they're on the second time to share what the experience was like acting on that thing that was based on what they cared about, invariably they say, thank you for getting me to do this. And I think that I hope that listeners will feel a couple things. One of the main ones is to stop feeling if I act, but no one else does, then what I do doesn't matter. Or these little things are so small. What's the point? But these big things are so big. It's too much to do and feel like I want to do this. I'm glad I, I enjoyed doing this. I want to do more. I want to share this with others. I want to share this joy, not deprivation, not sacrifice, but joy with others. And I want to, I want to help create that cultural change. Are you feeling inspired yet to take on your own project? Big thanks to Joshua Spodek for being such a wonderful guest on the show this week. I always find it very inspiring whenever I speak with him. You can find out more about what he does and read his blog posts, listen to his podcast at joshuaspodek.com or simply visit the show notes at thecmethod.com slash 216. Like I mentioned in the break, remember to join the waitlist for the C Method Academy if you want to be the first to be notified when those next membership spots open up. Again, the C Method Academy will be the monthly membership site and training program for those of you who love the podcast and want to apply the concepts and develop your communication and speaking and confidence skills. To sign up for the waitlist, go to thecmethod.com slash join. And that brings this week's episode to a close. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I'm Christina Cantors, and this has been Stand Out, Get Noticed. <laughs>